City of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England. I would like to introduce you to Adi Danda. Hi there. Welcome to the Peaky Agileist podcast, where I get curious about all things agile. Simply put, agile is about responding to change as quickly as possible, which can be pretty useful in today's fast-paced world. In each episode, I'll be inviting authors, thought leaders and a few friends to share their stories and insights in everyday language that even I can understand. So sit back, grab a samosa or two and enjoy. So it's taken a few weeks of juggling diaries, but I'm delighted to be joined by the best-selling author of Project to Product and CEO of TaskTop. He's written over a million lines of open source code and has more brains than an entire Agile release train. It's the amazing Dr. Mick Kirsten. Welcome, Mick. I, I think you might need some fact checking there, Pradeep, but it's it's great to, to be here and thanks. <laughs> thanks for the intro. Yeah. You're welcome, Mick. Um, is it two million lines of code? No, I think it was the thing you said after that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the brain spark. <laughs> One million is correct. So. Good stuff. Um, yeah, that would be actually quite interesting. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about those lines of code? That they, your fingers must be sore. Oh, I actually developed RSI through that part of the journey. Uh, I thought it was it was a neat, kind of near career ending thing that happened because I was I mean I was just a very kind of passionate and driven developer, right? I, I just loved writing code uh, in that part of my career, and I got to the point where and this is this is back in the the. 99 is when I started my first job as a professional developer at a research lab at Xerox Spark. And we invested a lot in our own productivity because we were actually working on a new programming language. And so we realized, well, we want to get everything out of, out of the way in things that are slowing down our productivity. Because the whole point of making new programming languages is to make programmers way more productive, right? You, you would just not bother making any programming languages unless you thought, you really had a way of making programmers more productive. So you really want to get everything else out of the way. And so we, from a kind of a, an infrastructure point of view, our team made sure we had everything was continuous delivery. All those, all those dozens of hours of productivity in a week actually gave me severe tendonitis because I was not spending all this time in meetings, not spending time all this friction or waiting for some installer or RPM or something else to work. I was actually just writing code that whole time. And but I noticed actually that it was it was the, this context switching between work on the keyboard writing code and switching to a user story, switching to a defect, uh, tracking issues, and so on. And I realized that in, that actually when I introspected my own work and I, I basically put the equivalent of a, a key logger, just the instrumentation on my uh, key and mouse logger on my operating system, I realized that when I was writing the code. Uh, it was affect just coding. It was affecting my RSI less. When I was thrashing and context switching between windows, between systems, it was affecting my RSI more. And so I realized, okay, so if I could even shift myself to, you know, I took care of the meetings, took care of all that friction, but if I could, as a, as a developer, shift myself more into creating value rather than looking for information and thrashing around, I could make my RSI better. And this turned out to be actually a directionally a much better solution than Advil, which is what the, the Xerox Park nurse was recommending at the time. It's just I stay on Advil for the rest of my life. So, so I did that, and then that's what kind of inspired me to, to do this for others in the developer tools that I was creating. And then more recently, of course, to do this for organizations with, with the flow framework, is to, to keep organizations within this flow to remove the friction, remove the waste, remove the uh, too high whip and flow load and so on. So, so yeah, it was, it's, it's been all throughout my career uh, my own, basically having experienced what it's like to, to be part of this highly effective and productive team with all the things taken out of the way and just how satisfying and great that is, 
uh, that end up manifesting itself in these million lines of code that are, that are more significantly more actually, I think, being left behind and, and still in use today. But more inter interestingly, these, these amazing memories of what that's like and wanting to, to give those experiences to others. Awesome. Thank you. That makes sense. And I, I guess before we delve into um, some of the, the project to product movement, I want to just um, get some of your views on um, defining what, what is agility for us in today's world and what is the magical state that every organization seems to be driving towards? So, and I think I, I can actually relate it back to the experience. So I think on that, on that team, we were just one team. So, you know, scrum size, feature size team. It was, I think it's getting the organization to that state. Like if you get, if you get an entire organization functioning as well as a single agile team, who's again, focused on building value, the impediments have been moved out of the way. Uh, they're, they've created the processes that they need and also the, the analytics and visibility that they need to understand how they're doing on delivering value. That to me is agility, right? And I think what's happened, what's frustrated me over the last, seeing the last, because that's been, wow, it's been 20 years, hasn't it? Since, since, since the start of that story. Uh, since the, those last 20 years of Agile for me is when agility is, is not around that. Right? Agility is about, is about making Agile teams or switching to the Spotify model or, or you know, taking a scaling model like SAFE, but over focusing on measuring some aspects of its ceremonies and so on. That, that's not the goal of any of those things, right? The goal, the goal of agility is to deliver value and then to learn from that and to feed that back in, to have the customer in the loop and such. And what I realized is it was, it's not that it was easy to achieve, but it was, it was very achievable at that team level. And the team level is just so much different than the team of teams level or the whole, the entire organizational level. So I realized that the big issue that we were having with agility is that we can't mistake what agility is at the team level with what agility is at the team of teams level or the organization level. And that's really what motivated me to create the flow framework where we needed to create an organizational structure that would en enable our agile teams to function as they would function if they were you know just c connected directly to a customer and working in what for me was this very elegant uh, open source structure so if we could the, the concepts of agility they just work i think we're done like and it was we were we were fairly close to done 20 years ago and we've had a tons of refinements in how scrum is done how to scale some of these agile practices how to connect them up to to agile release trains and so on but we're not done in terms of understanding when you've now got a large organization, when the agile team is disconnected from the customer because they don't interface with them directly. And that's when, you've got, when you actually need to understand what products are and what you measure and what the business aspects are. I realized we need another layer. And that was really the point of the flow framework. Awesome. Fantastic. And I think that moves us nicely on to project to product as a movement. So um, if you could perhaps just give us a little bit of background perhaps for somebody who hasn't read the book or is fairly new to the topic, a little bit about what is it and uh, how can it help us? Yeah, so I realized that one of the big disconnects I was seeing and that was very much anti the notions of agile and lean and value streams, those, some of those things that actually you know, showed up even in back, back then in Ken Beck's book, was that at a business level, organizations were looking at software not as a way to innovate and deliver value to the market, but as a way of, you know, supporting internal activities, right? It was not, and it's really due to the fact that for a lot of large organizations, IT came out of being a part of, you know, like just the infrastructure to keep the business going. It was never really about the, about the top line, about delivering on business results. It was just this cost center that needed to keep the lights on and deal with its issues of building up too much legacy and its infrastructure and, and all those fun things. But what's happened, of course, is with the shift of the economy moving to, to be a digitally driven economy and be supported by technology, that way of operating just doesn't work. So if you've got a way of, if the only way that you treat your software and your IT capabilities are as a cost center, you're never going to really make the right decisions to basically become a software innovator and and have this business agility that has you deliver more and more software value to the market through 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 software and digital. So I realized that the operating model for working with cost centers 
just does and project management just does not work for becoming a software innovator. At the same rate, you've had all these companies for the you know a good chunk of the last decade saying, well, there's we have digital disruption uh, and we need to become software innovators. So I saw this massive disconnect between the desire of those companies to become innovators and how they treated software and digital. Because they were basically applying something that really works, project management and, and tracking costs. Uh, it really works for simple and you know, somewhat complicated things like making a building, building a data center, tearing down a data center. Those are understood problems. You're not going to learn fundamentally new things uh, about the laws of gravity or concrete when, when you're making a bridge. When we're building software, we're always learning fundamentally new things. And that's, that's the entire reason that we need some kind of business agility, because we don't fully understand the market. We need to get an MVP into the market to learn from that market. We then need to iterate on that and invest where we're actually seeing traction and user delight and business results and de-invest elsewhere. So what I realized is that to get, it was not enough to get to be talking to these organizations that oh, you need to be more agile, you need to be more adaptive to the market, you need to, you know, Keep, keep pushing on your digital transformation. Uh, we needed a new operating model that tech companies used, that even innovative hardware companies used, which is about creating products. And products, are fu- products and product value streams are fundamentally about delivering value to a customer. It can be an internal customer, it can be an external customer, but they're about delivering value to that customer in this bucket of value that we call a product. And the way that we do it, which is called a value, value stream, all the, all the people and teams involved in delivering that value. And that's what we need to measure. And that until we started measuring value uh, in these organizations, we would never get to the point where they were innovators because all they were looking at is costs and activities. And costs and activities are not representative of value that you're delivering to a customer. So that's, you know, that, that was really the motivation for project to product, seeing agile transformations go completely off the rails because there was no way of measuring value and the way that you, the structure by which you measured value, which is product value streams, was non-existent. And so I realized, okay, that's how, rather than me just banging my head against more walls on saying you need to be more agile and you need to adopt these lean principles and so on, and these developer-centric ways of working, uh, I realized the key thing was, no, you need to shift your entire operating model from being under, around software and digital, from being project-centric where you just track costs to adding this layer of tracking value through product value streams and, and measuring flow. And so I think that's, that's what's resonated. I think, you know, the great thing is I'm seeing that help organizations actually just deliver on these, these agile transformations that they, they, that they set out to do. So. Fantastic. And Mick, in terms of then the, the work that you've been doing, because I, I hear you've been doing work with lots of big brands such as BMW, et cetera, uh, in, in banking. Can you share maybe some of the success stories uh, where you've taken this approach and, you know, you've seen tangible uh, gains for that organization. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what's happened, and this is this the, the pitfall I talk about in Project to Product of local optimization of the value stream, where you just see agile as just the way those agile teams work. So what the flow framework in Project to Product says is, no, you need to measure from your customer's perspective, not your perspective, your customers. So even if the agile team takes two weeks and one sprint to deliver something, if it took three months to get to the customer's hands, the flow time is three months. It's not two weeks. It's not two weeks plus I don't know, four weeks. It's, it's that end-to-end time of going from a request, uh, a new, you know, new feature, business epic or something you tried to deliver, to it actually being available to the customer in, in running software. And so by measuring these flow metrics, it's, it's actually just been amazing, the sort of insights. And even like in many cases, just the very low-hanging fruit that we've been able to identify. So you know, to give you an example... Uh, the you know, the upstream wait states on development are are just amazing. So you'll you'll have this uh, you know a, a very common. I'll just I'll give you some of the common patterns. A very common pattern that we see is that there's a lot of complaint that technology is moving too slow. The business is not getting things fast enough. Why you know why is and this is obviously as you mentioned. I've, I've personally been focused on the, the larger organizations, the, the, the well known brands who you know have this desire to to get better and now. Uh, because of the pandemic, to even accelerate how quickly they get better. Because bottom line is, it's just not been moving fast enough. So in, f- for it to deliver meaningful progress in terms of these transformations as, as the world is consuming content and services uh, at an increasing pace through, through digital. So 
So what we'll often see is that there's all this focus on how to make the agile teams work better and so on. And then we actually go and measure the flow metrics. And what we will see is through the wait states on the issues and, and work items that they're working on in their agile tool, all, you know, everyone assumes like, well, we're too slow in terms of doing our DevOps initiatives. And they're, but oftentimes we've actually seen that they've done okay. They've actually understood that, that problem with DevOps a few years ago. They're investing. It's really important they continue investing. They're not yet at continuous delivery because most of them aren't, but they're doing more continuous integration and they're doing fast enough deployment that the bottlenecks on developers are actually upstream. And it's upstream because some old school requirements management, because someone keeps canceling a meeting every three weeks that they actually need input on in terms of what they're doing. And so one of the endemic things we're seeing across these organizations is up, wait states upstream of development, where developers are not getting, you know, either, actually, it's interesting that um, Pradeep, you mentioned the, 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 that question of values, you know, how, when you get that friction in the way, what are you working on? If that input is not come to developers, the wait states are too long. They'll go work on something else. Yeah, right. They'll go. They'll go fix up some framework <laughs> that they've been trying to trying to fix, or just you know muck with some widgets to, to look better on a screen. But they're not delivering what's perceived as business value, and oftentimes that will be because of overly long wait states upstream. Another one that we're seeing, but in almost every single large deployment of the Flow framework, is flow load. So this is the work and uh, process metric. This is the WIP metric. And it's the vast majority of product value streams that we've measured have overly high flow load. So in terms of features, right. so there's too many features that have been asked of this value stream. Developers are thrashing. Then you combine that with a bottleneck upstream. The fact that the business side has not acknowledged how much tech debt has actually accumulated from overly high flow load for you know, many months or years now. And, and you get into these yeah, value streams, once you start looking them through the lens of the flow metrics, they're basically have ground to a halt in terms of their productivity. And there's not a shared understanding as to why. So the key thing of project to project the flow framework is to surface these dynamics around software to all the stakeholders at the right level, right? So that the, the project managers or product managers or business side, they actually understand that a lack of investment tech debt causes less value to be delivered in the future if you always ignore it so really that's and that by the way is another one in almost no organization that we've uh, implemented the flow metrics at has there been uh actually i can i think i can say this even more strongly there's not been a single organization where tech debt is tracked consistently across teams and value streams and that's a really big problem because it means you don't have a consistent view of it and almost certainly, you're severely underinvesting in reducing tech debt. And you're doing that because it's not visible. It's not that developers don't know it's there. They're just doing it on, you know, on their, either on their spare time or they're not doing it and things are just getting worse. So because it, it's not valued. And that's, that's really part of the, the other core things. The flow framework is, is trying to show you that each of these things represents value. It's not just the features. Reducing tech debt represents value in terms of your future ability to deliver working on risks, so security, data privacy, and so on, that's something you need to value as well because that's actually what makes your software safe or compliant. And that's critical for many organizations. So that, that's really the other thing that I want to surface because where we started this story is, you know, it, it tends to be all about features that delight users, but if, if we ignore these other key dynamics, such as defects, risks, and debts, those other flow items, three flow items in the flow framework, uh, we don't have the technology side gets it, but we need to elevate that to help the whole organization switch to this product operating model. Thank you. No, that was very substantial. So thank you for that. And I, I guess metrics are a little bit like going to the dentist. It's uh, it's never a pleasant experience um, and not too many people like them, but they're vital. We need metrics to stay healthy. And is there a danger of us having too many metrics? And how does a flow framework deal with that? Sure. So, I, yeah, I want metrics. That's a really good point. And I really want metrics not to feel like going to the dentist. And I think, <laughs> I think a big problem with metrics is A, and you alluded to this, Pradeep, is there are just way too many of them, right? And they change. And the business, what they want to measure changes and so on. That's why one of my goals with the flow framework was to say there are four flow metrics. That's it. These are the four right? It's been out there. I mean, this has been, I've been using it. 
uh, with internally at Tastop with customers for years now. Uh, it's been out there in the form of the book for nearly, you know, for a couple of years now as well. And these are still the four. There's, there's not a fifth that's been found. There's not been a, a fifth flow item that, that, that's been found. Even when I, you know, I, I uh, worked on the kind of very early versions of the flow framework and ran them by Dean Leffingwell, who's got kind of the richest agile taxonomy you could imagine, the most robust one, in, in my opinion, as well, in his head as he's evolved the, the, the safe framework. So I think the key thing is it needs to be a simple understanding and meaningful set of metrics. Uh, and the other, the most important thing, I think there, there are two key aspects of this. One is the metrics need to be meaningful to both the business and technology side. Because the challenge is, is when you come up with metrics that are just meaningful to technologists, like deploys per day is, is meaningful to technologists because they understand that oftentimes that has, the, well, if they don't resolve that bottleneck, it's the bottleneck, right? If, if, if you're not able to de deploy the software safely, easily, and so on. So just as I mentioned with, with our journey way back, that was key. That was one of the table stakes that we put in place at the first time. But that doesn't make it a meaningful metric to the business when they're waiting six months to get something to a customer or a business partner, and you're telling them that you can deploy eight times a day, right? So, so you, in the end, it's it's not about how you know quickly you can turn the crank. It's about how much value you can get to a customer. And so that's why the flow metrics are meant to. And this is not to say we need all these other metrics, this other telemetry, but the flow metrics are there to, again, just provide these four flow velocity, flow efficiency, flow time, and flow load, and to have everyone agree that those are the most meaningful things that we want to improve together, right? We know when flow time is shortened, we, our time to market is faster. That's just a fact, because flow time is just the metric of time to market. We know when we take too much flow load, our teams get less efficient, because we see their flow efficiency drop, because they're now thrashing, uh, because we've put too much work on them. So, uh, and you can actually see that if you reduce flow load, velocity goes up and, and flow time can go down. So you're actually getting more done uh, with less. So that's really the goal of, of just having these four simple flow metrics that measure the end-to-end -end value stream to always correlate them to a value metric. And then um, Dominica de Grandis is, and she's, uh, she wrote Making Work Visible. On um, my work with her at TASTOP, she's one of our flow advisors and, and she's, recently noticed to the second part of your question uh she's you know she has noticed some teams that for example you know that they, they there is that effect of like going to the dentist so the and it's i think this is because of the way that metrics have been used in these organizations in the past and sometimes they've been used to beat people up sometimes they've been used to prove points uh that you know where the conclusions actually may have been somewhere else and so there's there's kind of two key aspects of the of, of how to address that. So first of all, you know, the, the first thing is built into the flow framework. It's not a way of measuring individual productivity. It's not even a way of measuring team productivity, right? It's a way of measuring the flow of an entire value stream, which is a team of teams. It's at the level of a team of teams, right? So, and it's not a way of comparing the productivity velocity of team A to team B. It's just a way you, you, for each product value stream, You've got the flow metrics. They're aggregated across dozens or, or you know, up to 100 people usually because it's at that team of teams level. And then what you want to do at the business level is focus on improving velocity, on reducing flow time. So rather than comparing flow time of you know, product value stream A, which might have a bunch of mainframe code, to B, which, which you know, is all cloud native, it makes no sense to make those comparisons. You need to have different flow metrics targets for each of those things. And then the other thing is, and this came from Dominica de Grandis, is the notion of flow. She calls it flow safety. And is to actually say, you know, when, when work is made visible at this higher level, it allows leadership to actually help the teams, right? Because they'll all of a sudden see that the teams are constantly waiting on some design or requirements or compliance document, and they're constantly stuck. So the whole goal of these metrics is to, you basically, you want to show your data because in the end, what it's really meant to do is allow the organization to remove the bottlenecks that are slowing you down or frustrating you or causing you uh, even to be unhappy. That's why happiness is a metric in the flow framework. You know, when developers work on tangled architectures, they're less happy than they're, they're, when they work on highly modular architectures. And so the flow metrics are, again, meant to, meant to surface that. So I think the key thing is it's, it's a common set of metrics across business and technology that helps both improve how they work together because that's where the bottlenecks tend to be. And, and this notion of, you know, I think the, you know, we, we encountered one organization that didn't want to show their, 
this one value stream, this set of teams, didn't want to show their flow metrics so they were 100% agile. And it's the exact opposite thing that you want because A, there's, I don't even know what 100% Agile is, but they got that into their head somehow. I was going to say that, that was going to be my question. What is 100% Agile? Because if I had the answer to that, maybe. I didn't ask because <laughs> I, um, what, what, I, you know, what I said is, no, you want the metrics that show where you've got your bottlenecks and where you've got waterfall bookends on the way that you do Agile. That's actually what you want to show your leadership. And that's what they ask for because they want to help you. So again, but but the fact is that many organizations are coming from this context of metrics are going to the dent, like going to the dentist. So this simple set of metrics that's that's basically uh, meaningful for teams for how to unblock themselves is so important. And if those metrics were not meaningful to to helping teams, uh, it it would be more like going to the dentist. But when they are, as is the case of the flow metrics, I've actually seen it drive that that kind of help, and and that that I'm very happy about. So right. Fantastic. And so if an organization wanted to adopt the flow framework and the, and measure these, these metrics, is there a need to have sophisticated tooling or, you know, some form of, of tooling to capture these metrics, or is there an element of manual capture here from an organizational perspective? What would I need to think about if I wanted to bring in the flow framework. Right. So I think the key thing is the work is complex enough. And especially when it's larger scale, I mean, if you're a single agile team, you can do things like try to do some of this manually or doing a spreadsheet and so on. But, but really the important thing is it, it, ha- it needs to be automated. Like it's, it needs to be automatic. You don't want to be questioning the accuracy of these things and so on. And, and another key thing is within the flow metrics is they help you. So the number one thing in the flow framework is that they have to be der- derived directly from the tool network, right? You've got your tools. Um, you'll often have multiple tools because, you know, support desk will be a different tool than, than the agile tool. Uh, you might have a product management tool or a project management tool, requirements, finance tools, and so on. So, so the, the f- flow of information has to be derived from the way that people work because in the end, it's, it's when we've got these tools set up effectively, whenever, let's say, a developer is blocked on some business analysis, they'll actually transition the workflow state to blocked if there's such a workflow state because they want to get out of their queue and they want to indicate that they're blocked, right? Yep. And once you've got the visibility from the flow metrics, you actually have an incentive for developers to use that extra workflow state in your Jira or your Azure DevOps or, or wherever you're working because once you see those things in aggregate, you can make a decision along with the team saying, oh, yeah, right, you really are getting blocked on all this. Oh, yeah, right, our code review process is too slow. So we might need to invest in, in staffing up there or making a process cha- change there. So the, a fundamental aspect of the flow framework is you, don't wanna, you want people to work in the tools that make them productive and just use those tools in the way they were designed to be used. And they're yeah. all very rich in terms of their workflow settings and all those kinds of things. So then from that, you can extract what we call the artifact network, which is this, this flow of information, map it to value streams, and then start extracting the flow metrics. And so the key thing is let people work the way that they work. If your organization has 80 work items, so be it. If it has 10, so be it, right? And you can refine those over time. But there's no need to really change anything around the way people work because that's evolved around their different ways of working. And then you need from that way of working across the, that tool network, you need to extract the flow metrics. So you need to know what value stream they're a part of. You need to map workflow states into one of the four flow states. And the way that you can do that, um, you know, obviously, TaskTop has commercial solutions to implementing the flow framework. Um, you can try to extract it yourself. But the, the, the core thing is that data is there inside the tools. And it needs to be actually extracted live rather than post-processed after the fact. So if you like, it's a challenge if you're dumping it into a big data lake, for example, because it's really hard to actually query a data lake to understand, was this set of issues opened or closed? Because you've got so many different workflow state transitions and so on, different teams use these tools differently. Yeah. And the, the popular team tools get used very differently because teams use them the way that they like. That's why these tools are popular. It lets a team work the way they, that they want to work, the way that they find most effective. So what we've realized is the key thing is there needs to be this modeling layer above the tools themselves that allows you to model products, value streams, and then these flow items and flow item states. And with that, then that's what allows you to, without disrupting the way that people work, um, get this kind of visibility to, to help find their bottlenecks and help them work more, more effectively and more happily. So. 
Nice. If teams are having to change their their way of working to accommodate us capturing these metrics, I think um, that there are definitely barriers then for for, for teams to then um, kind of accept this this way of working. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so Mick, I'm going to let you catch your breath for a second. I was going to run a, a fun part of the podcast where we uh, do what we call the sprint of your life. So we're going to mimic a sprint and um, give you one minute to share as many useful tips as you can. Uh, and it could be anything to do with agile or non-agile. Um, and for every tip you give us, I'm going to give you a thousand points. And the idea is over time, we'll have a leaderboard uh, and we'll see which of our special guests um, hits the top of the leaderboard. Okay. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just swing it. Let's try it. <laughs> okay. So first of all, uh, understand your work, understand the flow of your work. So track it. If you've got work that's not captured by some tool that's meaningful to you, it's not visible. You can't improve it. You can't share it. Uh, you can't properly collaborate around it. So I think the key thing is we track our work. Um, when we track our work, we need to do it in a way that, that makes sense for us, that gives us value, that helps us innovate faster, helps us collaborate with our teams. So get that effective way of working, make sure it's there. And as an individual, use it. And if it's not working, adjust it. Add that new workflow state to your Agile tool. Make sure your tools are supporting you, not you supporting them. As a leader for an organization, enable those kinds of team tools. If you want, in the end, you want visibility, you want them to make your teams happier and more productive, you need to give them that kind of choice. If you're not taking their input on that, if you're not listening to what they did for themselves, what works for them, chances are they won't adopt what you're doing anyway. And actually, these, these tools will be the impediment of your adoption. Uh, <laughs> time's up, time's up, time's up. Oh my God, I'm going to lose so badly. Oh no, no, you did fantastic. I think you had some some tips within tips there. So I gave you a couple of extra points. Oh, if you can give me credit for the tips within tips, that'll be good. <laughs> and the explanation, I think we, we, we'll give you an ex, uh, extra points for that. So um, I, I noted about five, but I'll round it up. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll give you maybe six on that one. Deal. So 6,000 points for Mick. Well done. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Mick. So we're sort of coming to the end of, of the session. I had a couple of questions that I've been asked by teams more recently, and I thought I'd get your views on, on these. So maybe my last two questions, really, um, as we finish off. So the first one was, I hear many different approaches for structuring agile teams. So we talk about moving away from component teams to feature teams, even platform teams, support teams, all of these different structures. And we, we talk about having all of these teams within a value stream, an end-to-end -end value stream. Can you share your thoughts on what is the most efficient team structure so that we do support flow and maximize flow? So I, my sense, I don't think there is one. So, and you know, we've got had some interesting work, um, like the team topologies book recently, but the, I think the key thing is we've got patterns of success. So I think feature teams are a pattern of success. Uh, those can easily turn into anti-patterns. If you think every team you're going to have is a feature team and is going to be responsible for something end-to-end, -end, but you've got a large organization with some, you know, basically diverse talent pools where you can't actually you know, structure uh, a feature team in, in this kind of way. So I think the important thing is there's been a lot of really good work on agile team structures, and there's which you know, I think it's there's this you know we know the notion of Scrum is effective in many organizations. Uh, we know that we do need cross-functional aspects on teams. Increasingly, we know that roles like SREs, let's say, are important to to work with teams or be embedded in teams. In terms of, in addition to having those functions be separate, so I think there are many patterns for how you organize, and so many of them have to do with the context that you're coming from and the kind of work that you're doing. Where I see the the key place to focus is at the team of teams level. I think this is where so many agile efforts fall down. So think of first of the value stream, which is team of teams. So we you know typically recommend between one and ten, one and ten teams because it's hard to scale. You know team you want know, same way that you scale Scrum teams, you want to scale your team of teams level. So up to ten teams on each product value stream, and then you look at what does it take to deliver that on that value stream. And you might decide that you'll have some specialists on this particular product value stream. You'll actually have a team of SREs, right, of slightly reliable engineers, because that's so important. That aspect of the infrastructure uh, is, is so important to this particular team. Or not. You'll actually rely on this, you know, entirely on this on the service from one of the cloud providers like Amazon or, or, or Azure, AWS or Azure. 
So I think the, the secret to unlocking the right kind of team structure is to understand the structure of your product value stream and whether that product value stream has a ton of user facing components, right? Where you actually need a lot of user interface talent. You might even put a team of designers on that single product value stream. If it's a lot of backend stuff, a lot of you know, APIs and, and data pipelines, well, guess what? You probably won't do that. You'll rely on a centralized team and have that as a supporting function of that particular product value stream because you just need a few icons here and there uh, or something of that sort. So I think the key thing is, first of all, you know, absolutely leverage the, the, all of the great knowledge and work out there in terms of the, the different team structures. But my advice is start with structuring what the product value stream needs are for that particular product, be it an internal product, an external product, and the different kind of talent that you need on it, rather than obsessing of cramming in all that talent into a single feature team. Right. No, that makes sense. That's great advice. Thank you. And my final question for today, and this is a big question. So if you get this one, um, if I, I guess, right, um, you and I can retire uh, right now. So... Agile seems to have become a bit of a commodity product. Organizational leaders assume we can buy this product off the shelf and slot it into an organization and hopefully everything will work much better. So do you feel Agile is done? And what is the next big thing? So what's beyond Agile? Yes, I think as a set of practices and tools, I actually think Agile is mostly done. The, The practices are out there trying to invent new models will cause diminishing returns. And I remember when this happened with programming languages, we still had neat ideas, but when you're getting 3% gains from really significant efforts in terms of actual productivity, well, then chances are it's done, or even 5% gains, right? You need, we need to look at where you're gonna get 2X, 5X, 10X gains in terms of delivering value for customers. And obviously, to have that sense, you need a way of measuring value, which is why so much of my focus and the focus on the flow framework has been on, on measuring value. So I think the... While Agile is done, it's, 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 it's very far from what you said, is that you can actually buy it off the shelf and put it into your organization. Because if you put Agile into a project-oriented organization, a waterfall organization, you'd kill it, right? It, it just doesn't work. Well, you, you'll frustrate the teams in the, in the process, but, but, and they'll continue trying and trying to help you change and help the organization change. So it's not a bad thing to start on, but... You can't put Agile into an organization that does not have a notion of business agility and and product orientation. So I think that next thing is, is that switch from from project to product, from basically project management to value stream management, and that will enable all of the great things we've won on Agile, which is basically done, to thrive in large organizations. Because the way it works today in, in startups uh, it just works. It is done, right? The way it works in unicorns or tech giants who have that product and value stream management structure, it is done. It just works. And so it's just a question, how do we make agile work, the things that, that are done in these large organizations? And the answer to that, to that is, is in product value streams. Fantastic. So you heard it there first. Product value streams is the way to go. Stop creating new frameworks uh, because we're, we're encountering diminishing returns. So that's great advice. So Mick, I just want to thank you so much. I, I know you've got a little bit of a cough at the moment and uh, and it's not the easiest of gigs to do. So I do really appreciate um, your time today. I think there's some amazing insights you've given us. And I just want to thank you once again for uh, for making the time today. Oh, my pleasure, Pardeep. And rest assured that the, the cough is from drinking uh, too many lattes this morning, not from any, anything more severe. <laughs> but it's it's been uh, it's been great to chat with you. So. Thank you so much and good luck with your future endeavors. Cheers.